or a production designer or an actor or, or a costume designer, if you sort of show up and tell us, well, you know, we can't afford that or we lost the light, we're going to have to shoot it differently. You know, as a director, all you can do is really maintain like this even keel positivity around, even though you know that it's probably a complete fuck up, you're like, no, it's going to work. This is going to work. This is the right thing. You know, let's, let's keep going. And um, today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out EnigmaElements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, Elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Aram Rappaport. How you doing, Aram? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. I appreciate it. We had one of your compadres on last week, uh, Mr. J- a little guy, a new guy coming up, John Legazamo. Uh, uh, arch nemesis, my arch nemesis. I hope I never <laughs> speak to him again, but he's semi-talented. So, you know, I put up with him. You put up with him. Yeah, yeah. he gets the financing sometimes. So, you know. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, don't give him a big head. He's going to watch this and think he's, you know, powerful or something. <laughs> Exactly. But uh, but I appreciate you coming on, man. You've had you've had a heck of an adventure, you know, coming up the up the the ladder as well. You've got some shrapnel as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Course, without question, some indie film, some indie film shrapnel uh, well, along the way as well. So first question is, brother, how and why in God's green earth did you want to do this and get into this business? <laughs> the, 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 oh, oh, the business in general. Oh, my God. What a what a uh, what a good question. I've never asked myself. Um <laughs> I think I never did either, by the way. I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. It's such a, you're, you're just like, wait a sec. Like now existentially, I have to think about things. Um, no, I mean, my, my, you know, originally I wanted to, to, to act and be an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in LA. Uh, my dad was a writer. Um, and then he ultimately, uh, you know, taught screenwriting as well. Um, so when I was, um, you know, growing up and sort of training as an actor and, you know, went to a lot of class and did that, you know, he, he had always said you should really write uh, for yourself because that's going to, you know, be a mechanism to help you, you get things made. And, and, and so, you know, organically, I sort of moved into writing a little bit. And then um, I, I realized, you know, it, it just feels better to sort of control the narrative from behind the camera. And, and, and really, you know, I was so interested, you know, in being on set, I would, you know, I did a couple little things and I would always you know, what are we shooting now? What's next? And, you know, the director would always be, you know, why don't you just stand over there until it's your turn to, you know, say your lines. But it sort of interested me to be more, uh, you know, mechanically, uh, you know, involved in the process. And so I think organically for me, you know, d- directing just helped control the narrative. Um, and I think throughout the years, like I've sort of learned that my skill set is really just, um, uh, you know, helping everybody else who's actually talented, like see the vision you know, and motivating them to, uh, to, to, to ultimately, you know, put their all in, into a project. And I think sort of the only place for someone like that, that is inherently like, you know, not talented, but like can rally the troops would be, you know, that leadership role, you know, to put it mathematically, but that, that, so that's, you know, that's where I ended up. And I, I, um, you know, I love it. And I think, uh, you know, my, my, my trajectory is sort of odd, you know, we, we, you started with indie film, um, you know, did a few films and then, um, and then sort of transitioned into commercials uh, aggressively and did, um, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been doing a lot of commercials and founded uh, an agency called The Boathouse, where we're an agency studio hybrid. And so we do, um, we, you know, we do a lot of commercials and that's really, uh, you know, where I've like honed my skills, um, both on the storytelling side, as well as really like, you know, from a production standpoint. And now this project, The Greenville is like the first uh, I mean, outside of Latin history mornings, but this is really the first sort of like narrative driven thing I've done in, in, in quite a while. So it was a really interesting transition back into that. There is a, an insanity, isn't there, for us to do what we do? It's, it's because look, at the beginning of the, at the beginning, it's, it's easy. Look, when everything's going well ish, yeah. it's never well all the way. It's never, never, all the way. never, N- never, never, never every, like the doors all open, the money just flies in. All you have is time and money to make your projects. That doesn't never. happen. But 
when you're coming up though, it's so hard. It's and and there's so much no no so many no's against you. The grind is so hard. You don't even there's no guarantee that anything that you're thinking of doing is going to actually come into life. That's right. How, yeah, of course. How did how did you keep going in those early years? Like when you were just grinding out short films and trying to just get your stuff seen and made and just get just try to get your foot in the door. Yeah, I mean, so you know, I never went to college. Um I never you know, I, I, my mentality has always been sort of like, you know, just get on the horse and pretend you can ride and, you know, see what happens. So, I mean, I, I admittedly made a lot of mistakes, right? You know, I mean, I, I would, you know, have always been very good at sort of pitching the vision or selling the vision, scrapping together a little bit of money, raising money, you know, pitching people on this sensational thing that we're going to do. And then really falling on my face uh, in, the produ- in the production element because I just didn't know what I was doing. So I think for me, it's a little bit backwards, right? Like, you know, a, a lot of people, like, you know, I, I went to film school, I really honed my craft. And then I had a hard time getting into the, the business. I was sort of the opposite. I, I, I was very bullish in raising money and finding ways to produce things in a scrappy way and then fell completely flat on the execution because I, that's where I was learning. I'd never done it before. And I was just like, I'm, I, you know, this sensational, I'm going to direct and do a movie and do this and do that sort of usurped the craft itself. And I think that, um, you know, on my personal journey has been like really important, you know, moving away from this, you know, I want to do it because it seems cool to, you know, this is a craft and like, what am I trying to say with these, uh, you know, with these projects? So you were, you were, you were flying the plane while you were, you were building the plane while you were flying it. Absolutely. (laughs) No, no question. And I mean, we we all are, right. I mean, I'm sure you have stories where you're just like, I have no idea how I'm going to shoot this this scene, but like, it might work, it might not work. It's we don't know. you know, isn't it fascinating, dude? Because so many of us, and you know, and again, I've had the pleasure of talking to some really insane, legendary filmmakers. Of course, of course. And I and I talk to them, and I ask them director questions, just questions that yeah. only a director, doesn't matter what level you're at, you could be yeah. a short film director, or you could be a two hundred yeah. million dollar Oscar winner. It doesn't matter, but. That what you just said is so indicative of a director. Like, okay, we're here. Yeah, I don't know how we're going to do this today. Um, let's let's go because everyone thinks of yeah. the director as like Hitchcock or right. like Fincher right. that like did the shot fifty thousand times in previs, and he's just basically just shooting with with real people right. to get the shot because he's already shot the whole movie and edited the entire movie in previs over a year. Right, and and then he's just like executing his vision. There's like no wiggle room. And that's right, basically right. that's the the new generate the the twentieth first century Hitchcock in the way of right. approaching the project, right. but so many most if any if not almost all there's always scenes that just like oh well the sun's not the sun's not where it needs to be oh totally. we lost the, we lost the location so all my storyboards are gone so totally. you just have to kind of sit there and figure it out but I I wanted to kind of demystify that for people listening because a lot of young filmmakers think that. Oh, you must be you're working with, you know, John and you're working on these big projects with these big stars and all this kind of stuff. And you you have it all figured out. And I and I know that you walk in with a plan, but the fit hits the shan, bro. You got to roll. And that's what makes a director is how to adjust and compromise and move through the stuff that's thrown at you all day. Correct. Totally. And I think it's like, you know, it's crisis leadership, right? Like, you know, (laughs) you you you, it's it's you know, everything's going to go wrong. And that's okay. Like you really have to embrace that. And I think the thing that I've learned, you know, in the beginning you walk on set and you think um, it's really exciting and sort of like, it's a drug to have the power. Oh God, yes. Yes. And right. I mean, mean, you walk, you walk on and you think everybody's asking me things. Everyone's listening to me. I have all the answers, but, but, but then as you, as you get very bad reviews on things and people really, (laughs) sort of Pick bring you it up. back down to earth afterwards you realize you you know this is such a collaborative process that it's okay to to bring those trusted sort of pieces together whether it's a cinematographer production designer whatever and be like i know what i'm trying to say with this scene i don't know how we're going to get there let's all talk about it and i think that's the biggest lesson that i've sort of learned over the years is this you know if if, if you as a director have 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 leadership and vision but you can still be humble in execution um, you know, you're going to thrive in a different way than if you have to pretend that you know everything because n- no oh, one no. does. I mean, everybody says they had no idea how to, I mean, Spielberg has stories about how the sun was in the wrong spot. And he's like, I don't know. And he's obviously a genius on a different level where you think, 
you know, e- even though that son was in a different spot, he probably had eight ideas and, you know, oh. he ran them by his cinematographer and one of them was like the thing that they were going to do. But I think at, at all levels, I mean, especially for young directors, it's like, you, you know, rely on the people that you're hiring and, and, and say, you know, I don't know, this is my vision though, that I'm steadfast and how do we get there? You know, and you're still going to be well-respected. On oh, absolutely. I, I, I love that this, that, that you said the addictive kind of drug it, of the power. It, totally. My God, look, I, and I have, I'll tell you a story real quick. When I was coming up, I, I made a, a, a short film that got a lot of attention around town and all that kind of stuff. And I had, uh, I was like one of the first to shoot like uh, with um, airsoft guns. So I was using airsoft guns. It was an action movie and all this kind of stuff. And I was using muzzle flashes and post and stuff like that. So another filmmaker, uh, uh, another crew found out about us and they're like, hey man, can we rent your guns? And we're like, Sure. So I went down to the set and this is in Florida, like in the middle of South Florida somewhere, went down one night and I had a bag full of soft, soft airsoft guns. <laughs> what, a bag <laughs> full of weapons. In oh, fuck, but, no, no. This is early, early 2000s. So uh, I'm walking in and I, then we go into the trailer where the director is and the amount of pomp, pompous, like arrogance of this guy, the, he was, Three, I'm sorry, three steps short of just having a monocle and a freaking bullhorn. I'm not joking. Like he was so yeah. far gone. So when <laughs> I brought, I'm, so I brought in and he didn't know that I was a director or anything. He was just talking to me like I was a PA, which was like even more disrespectful. But I just let right. him play it out. I right, 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 right. Yeah. What are and you going to do like, at that point? It's his yeah, set. And, let him go. And, uh, whatever, dude. I don't care. You're going to give me some money for these guns for the weekend. Sure. I don't care. <laughs> I'll take the so, cash. <laughs> so he took the shotgun. I, sh- I shit you not, dude. Took the shotgun pulled out a viewfinder i'm not a viewfinder and pointed the <laughs> shotgun at himself and said these will do and i'm like oh my god even then i was still coming up but i even then i knew this guy's out of his mind right 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 right, right. oddly enough the movie didn't go anywhere but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's just it's just the the do you, you want to call the, him out by name Call I wish I, I wish I wish I did, man. I, wish, I, don't, I didn't even give the the memory bank a, a space for his name, the name of the movie, none of it. I don't remember anything other than like a couple of things that happened that night. But I never yeah. forgot him. I'm like, okay, so that's an example of what I don't want to be as a director. totally, totally. Um, so, <laughs> so all right. So when you got your, so you've been making these short films, and then you get your first feature off the ground. How did you get that first feature? which is always the toughest one to get off the ground. Who, how did you convince someone to give you cash? <laughs> so, so, you know, I think, um, so the first thing that I did was this. So, so I, I had a friend, um, Thomas Decker, who's an actor and he was in, I, I forgot what, uh, there was a show called the Sarah Connor Chronicles on Fox of course. for a while. Yeah. Yeah. The, T- the, T- the played, Terminator stuff. Yeah. The, yeah. The Terminator thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And he played, he played John Connor and this is like right when that show was coming oh, out. Oh yeah. 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 Of course. I, I love that show. I used to love that show. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It was a great show with Lena Headey. It was like very, it was a very exciting thing. And he had, he had wanted to be a director and he is a director. Uh, he directs a lot of like very cool stuff. And he, um, he went out, we, we had sort of this group of friends, you know, in LA growing up this sort of creative little think tank. And he said, you know, I'm going to go make a feature. Um, I'm not going to do a short. I'm just going to make a feature. I have no money. I'm going to direct. I'm just going to get a bunch of my friends and we're just all going to be in it. Um, and he did that thing and he put me in it. And, you know, I think Megan Fox was in it. And it's like, like there's some Brian Austin Green at the time, like some very like cool people all did this thing. Who knows what happened to it? But it was super inspiring to see him. You know, he did that thing. And I was like, oh, yeah. Wow. Like he just pulled favors and, you know, asked his friends to be in this thing. And it was that was my impetus for saying, you know, oh, yeah, I want to go and pull these same favors and, uh, you know, and see if I can do it also. And so, you know, sort of to a lesser degree, I mean, I didn't have a show like he did, but I, you know, I was able to pull some favors with people and and um, uh, specifically, uh, you know, Leonard Moulton's daughter, Jesse, who's, um, uh, you know, a great friend who I've known forever. You know, she really like supported it and was like, you know what, I'll do makeup on this thing. And like, you can use my house and like, well, you know, this is like right out of high school. And she was just so supportive of like the process and really like brought in some, some cool pieces. And that, that was like the first thing that was like how I did a first sort of feature. I brought in a cinematographer that was also sort of coming up and, 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 and wanted a feature, you know, that, that's also another like sort of piece oh, of yeah. advice is oh, this, yeah. you know, a lot of people do short films, right? Like why not just do a, like a really shitty 
75 minute short film and then people want credits and they want to be a part of it. You know, no one needs to be a part of a short film, but everybody needs to be a DP on a, on a, on their first feature. So like those are, you know, thinking outside the box in that way, like is, is, is super helpful and leverage. So I think that that was my first real thing where I thought, you know, let me try directing and I'll figure it out. And, um, you know, it totally, <laughs> totally sucked. And then <laughs> there was another thing that sucked and another thing that sucked. But <laughs> well, dude, it's like my, when I did my first feature, I did the exact same thing. Got a bunch of my friends over in LA. Yeah. You know, this insane cast together of all these comedians shot the whole damn thing in like eight days. I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to DP this thing myself. I've never yeah, yeah, exa- yeah, exa- and you have to, you have to. And I just like, oh, I'll figure it out. And I'm like, if I could get it down the middle, I'll fix it in post. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm going to call her. So I'll do the, and you just, and you just kind of go for it. And at the end, you're just like, Hey, you know, I got it made. It was like, it was just me proving to myself. I could finally get a feature made after like so many years of doing commercials and music videos and other things totally. that I've done. I was just like, screw it. And every, and then it just worked out. Um, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. That, and that's a big tip for anyone listening. Shorts. No one cares about truly no one. It yeah, could, yeah, be, right, the, right, right. It could right. be honestly the, uh, an Oscar nominated or winning short film. No one cares, but on IMDb, it says feature. It adds a lot more value to, people and and they will they'll they'll work for you for free they'll work for you for a cheap discount just for the shot it's a great piece of advice and it feels it feels like it feels like now there's just so many more mechanisms to create something that's feature length or episodic length versus just doing something because shorts are great like i know you know there are some fabulous shorts that are insanely cool oh but I don't, but I don't know. And I don't know enough about that world, but you think like, I feel like, you know, even 10 years ago, you know, there were shorts that would come out of Sundance and be greenlit at a feature at a mini major or something where you would do like a Fox searchlight, you know, based on shorts. It feels like that just doesn't happen anymore. It was like at a time when it was hard to get a short made, it was like, wow, that's a proof of concept. Now you're kind of like, it's this weird, aggressive, you know, we're, we're at this place in indie film where you we're, we're, we're you know, excited. Yeah, it's exciting. You can get things made. Uh, for cheap, it's also equally as hard, but I think it's just, it's, it's, you have to be so relentless and, and that, that's such a good point. Like, you know, if it's a feature, there's like some great talent that just will want to be involved. And that, that's what happened on the Green Veil. Vale, actually, we had the cinematographer that I shot a lot of commercials with. He hadn't, Luca, he hadn't done, Luca Fontini, he hadn't done a feature yet, or he hadn't done anything in the narrative space. And ours was a show. Um, but it's still, it was, it was a narrative and he just thought, I need, I need this right now. Like, I need this. I'm going to kill it. My agents are going to have, you know, this is, this is going to bring me to the next level on the, on the feature side. And so he, you know, and we paid him a lot less than we would pay him on commercials and, you know, and he, and he did it. And I think that, and that's why, you know, exactly what you just said. Because he needs it. And I think nowadays the feature is the proof of concept. Right. Because anybody right, right. can make a short and when shorts were hard to make, then that was a thing. But now that anyone can make a short at a very high level, now you've got to like, just keep going. Just keep Like I was at a, a festival once I saw 45 minutes short. I'm like, what's wrong with you? What's yeah. Just keep you? going. Keep, keep going. Yes. 20 more minutes. Come on, dude. Just, just break 70 minutes, like 68 to 70 minutes. And you totally. c- officially call yourself. a Totally. Feature. Totally. Just, totally. Just keep going, dude. Totally. totally. And I, 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 you know what, my, my first thing that we just sort of, I guess, got distribution was this thing called innocent that, um, uh, you know, I was kidnapped, true story, in Chicago when I was 18. And um, we, I turned it, I adapted it into um, this single take wow. uh, thriller that, that Alexa Vega, the, kid, the girl from Star yeah. Kids, uh, Spy Kids, what was yeah. Star Wars, Spy Kids. She, she starred in it and it was this one take thing and we did it in Chicago, um, you know, and choreographed it. And I learned how to use Steadicam and I shot it. And that's something where I'm like, it's going to be a feature. You watch it and you're like, this could have been a short. <laughs> like it could have been, it could have been 10 minutes. It could have been 15 minutes. It would have been brilliant. It was 80 minutes and we all fell asleep. But, you know, I learned, I learned through that process. You know, that's where I was like, you know, I want it to be a feature. It's, and by the way, we had so much support because it was a feature, this one take thing and every, you know, it was Oh no. Yeah. 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 You, you, you built, you built up. Look, it's like, it's just like when you do some of these, these indie projects, it's kind of like you're building up the carnival. So totally, you, you're, totally, the, you're, the, totally. you're the carnival barker. So totally. when I did my first big short and I had like uh, nobody, nothing, it was all I like, I'm like, dude, it's all visual effects. It's going to be totally. this action thing. And I had like these storyboards and I had a concept art and I made it look like it was the next X-Men, and, you know? And everyone was like, I just want to see how, the, if this guy can even pull this off. And that's how many people jumped on board to work for free. They're like, I just want to see you either fail or make it. Either one's going to be fantastic. hundred percent. 
hundred percent. And it's like, it's like you, 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 um, it is like a traveling circus. Cause you're like, you're on location with people you oh, would never car- spend time we're carnies, with. We're carnies, dude. We're carnies. To- totally. Carnies. And you think like, we're like sort of like highfalutin society, societal, you know, bourgeois carnies, but like, it's bullshit. Like we go out there and we don't shower for a month. You're like eating shitty food. You know, no, you like, like your grandma's catering with ba- bagels that she found in the back of a. If you're you know, lucky, butter. if you're lucky, if, if, yeah, you're, if you're lucky, lucky, you get that. No, it's true. It's 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 true. It's totally true. No, but it's it's but 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 it's so exciting because you're like you know so what? Much fun. Like, it's so much and, fun, dude. And 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 every step of the way, you think like the only people that go through that process, you know, the only people that really not 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 if the film's good, who cares? Like if it's good or not? Like if you can get through the process, like it's because you believed that your vision was like absolutely unequivocally untold in any other way. And like, that's the thing that gets you, whether it's true or not, who cares? You know, there's reviewers, there's this, there's distributors. But the fact that you can just get through that process means that you had such like resolute power to be able to not give up on that thing. And th- that that's like the most fun to me is challenging yourself where you're just like, we shot nights, we, you know, is an, it's a 20 hour day. Do I try to get one more take when everyone's exhausted? Because I feel like I need it. Or, or do I, or do we just go home and give up and say, you know, this was good enough. It's probably going to cut, you know, and it's those moments that oh, challenge you man. on such an emotional level and a physical level, you know, and you think you get through that. And there's such a rush at the end of production where you're just like, we did it. Like we did that thing. Who knows if it's good, but we did it. You know, we got through and that. that. And that's like when Kubrick, you know, would say, he's like, Hey, you know, we're all here. They built the sets. Let's, let's stay until we get it right. You know, totally. Totally, and then totally. 85 takes later, we can move on. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. And that, that's like, I feel like the one thing I've learned in commercials is sort of how to cut and how to, you know, sort of maintain the sanctity of like those performances and like, mm-hmm. you know, protect the actors in that process um, in a way that, you know, especially for this most recent thing where we shot like eight episodes and, you know, five, we shot like 250, 300 pages. So we were shooting... 15 to 20 pages a day with, with a single camera. And it, it, it all looks really pretty. I mean, single? That I, you did a single on this, a single camera. Yeah. 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 Why? So we, were, we were, well, because so, so this is another thing. So Luca, our DP really did not want to shoot with two cameras. Fair um, enough then. Fair enough. And, 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 and he wanted to, you know, and, and by the way, like I, I would challenge him on that because I'm like, we're never going to make our days. If you're trying to light a single frame, you know, we need to cover this in the right way it turned out that he was just so fluid in the way that he lit and these images look like, I don't know if you've seen any of it, but the images yeah, look like, yeah. like, yeah, they look like Norman Rockwell paintings. You're right, you read my mind. They look like paintings. He did a fantastic job and, and, and the production design and the, in the, the wardrobe and the way it was all laid out. It was, yeah, yeah. It's it was, a gritty, it's, it's, it's a gritty world. And you think like, you know, that was one of those things where I just thought, you know, I'd worked with this guy in commercials so long. I know how we were. I'm like, you know, we have a shorthand, you know, if I'm trying to sort of cut in my head, and 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 we we can maybe make it work with one camera, you know. So that's the, that's, that's the doing. other that's the other thing that a lot of filmmakers don't understand too. Is like, let's say you're a young filmmaker and you and you get your first project out, and let's say there's a DP who yeah. he just super advanced has done ten million dollar, fifteen twenty million dollar movies, and he's like, you know what, I'm going to do your hundred thousand dollar movie if yeah. you don't like the story. That is a death sentence. Because they, it's a death sentence, right? I've been there too. Because if they're used to those kind of resources, they don't understand how to make a hundred thousand dollars worth of resources work. <laughs> you can go the other way, yeah, but it's really hard to go back. So, like, I'm, I, I yeah. you know, you you can't give James Cameron a hundred thousand dollars to make a movie. Like, he's yeah. incapable totally. of of telling. He actually, I, I actually, uh, I knew somebody who worked with him, and he was talking to somebody on a set. And the, and the guy said, oh, yeah, I just made my feature. It's like, oh, great, man, great. You know, what it is? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, I grabbed 100,000 bucks and I meant to make it. And you could see Cameron's face. The, the computer started to crack. He couldn't understand. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah. been so far, he's been so far, so long, James Cameron, that he couldn't totally. grasp the idea of 100, like, it's just, what? Good. And, and by the way, we should all be so lucky. Like I would, like, would, 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 would love to not grasp the idea of uh, like I don't, I don't to work around ideas that like I don't, under, I, like what, what I'm like you you've been Jim Scammer for thirty years, so you don't understand these things. Right, you've right, been right. Ridley Scott for thirty years, and and you've shot ten thousand commercials and. Ooh. 
<laughs> like well, that's, I was about to, I, I was about to mention that because, you know, going, you know, having done commercials for a while now, you know, whether it's like, you know, for Apple or Victoria's Secret or whatever, yeah. you know, I mean, th- those, everyone says they don't have any money, but when it comes to selling product, if, if a client believes that that's a, if there's a piece of creative, that's going to help the money will be there. It's so different. You know, when you go back to doing something on the independent level where you just think, I can't convince anybody that this crazy one or that I need the tech that I need the techno crane for five days. Yeah, exactly. Like we just we can't we can't do it. So that was but that was also super exciting to me because for me it was like you know having having I don't want to say it's a sterile world. It's a very exciting world being doing commercials. But like you you know you're reporting directly to uh, a purpose. You know it's 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 you're selling product, brother. You're selling product. That's it's commerce. I mean that's that's. That's the thing. It's not art. So it's a different, it was a totally different mindset, which was such a rush to be like back in that space and be like, oh yeah, no, I don't have as much money, but I also can just do it the way I want to do it. I can just, and, I can go do this thing. And I don't have to spend, you know, eight hours lighting a bottle. No, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where like, you know, it plays into, I, I feel like, you know, I always try to like double down on like, what, what's my purpose? Like, why, why do I want to do this? Why am I, you know, and like at the end of the day, um, you know, you you want people to really connect with what you make. And I feel like that that's been a through line for me in terms of, you know, any commercial I do, there's the really good ones that like people are like, wow, that was a good commercial. There's the really right. crappy ones that still perform well. And you think, oh, I'm glad it worked, but oh, I just wish it would have created me better. And those are the moments that remind me that like, oh yeah, like I want to be a storyteller. Like my, my number one goal is not just to do a job or facilitate a thing. It's like, you know, I, I want to be able to tell narratives that like really, you know, really, really hit. And so it's, it's, uh, you know, that's why it's nice, you know, it's fun to fight for, you know, anything to, you know, to create anything linearly. I mean, it, and it's a miracle that ever gets made, period. No, it's a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle. I mean, it's impossible, it's, but especially it, it, in COVID it, now, in COVID now, it's, oh, like, it's even worse. It's even, it's even more impossible to get anything made. It's, um, it's, it's impossible. And John reminded me of that every day as he was getting r- rammed up the nostril with a, a COVID test telling me that he, you know, I, he was doing this for me. And, you know, uh, so I, you know, I thought he was going to walk every time he got a, I I you know, I said we could move to the, you know, the anal COVID tests if he wanted, but he, you know, he stuck with the nose. So I don't know. He stuck with the nose, you know, but you know, that's, that's, you know, that's John, but uh, I'm just saying Meryl Streep would have done whatever it needed to be. I'm just saying she would have done whatever Daniel day would have done whatever it took. I'm just saying, can you follow up with John on that actually? Because that's a very good, that's a very good point. I mean, I heard Daniel day and Denzel, they were, they had no problem with whatever needed to be. What was John? What I I tell this story a lot, just because I I like the article exists, but you know, in China, like during, you know, during the Olympics, I read some, uh, there was some article that said, you know, China brings back, you know, anal COVID swabs for Jesus tourists God. at the airport, Ma- manual <laughs> anal COVID swabs. And I, and I brought this article to set and showed it oh to John. God. And I was like, oh John, God. this is the new, um, this is the new norm. So we're swapping out the nose for the, you know, the anus. And, and then I just walked out and I walked out and I said, you know, it's not like today. No, no, yeah, totally. I'm like, it's not today. Today, you know, we're still doing the nose, but tomorrow the hospital is going to bring in the guys that do the, the anal. It's a different crew. And, you know, I just wanted to let you know. And, you know, anyways, great day. I'll see you out there. And then his assistant came running out and he's like, is, is, uh, is that, um, are we, are we doing the anals? Is that, is that a thing? I'm like, no, it's not a fucking thing. What are you talking? Of course not. Why would we ever do that? That's crazy. I'd rather get COVID. What do you mean? So that was, that was, that's my relationship. Oh my God. That's amazing. Oh, that's the, like the best story. I'm going to use, I'm going to tell that story everywhere. That's, that's well, but it exi- you can Google it exists. I'm not just like some, no, know, no, but, but your story with John. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's an exclusive. That's the exclusive. So, so are we, uh, are we, are we doing the anal swabs? Are we, yeah, I'm like, tell him yes. You should have, no, 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 you should have, you should have, you should have kept that going for a little bit. I should have filmed it the next day and had, yeah, you should have, and... no, you should have done, you should have done a whole jackass thing. Like they came totally, in totally, you know, totally. like, brought it a good bring and bring the, like, get one of the grips that John didn't see and totally, have him totally. be the guy doing it. Like a hundred percent. Meanwhile, we're doing this like super deep, dark, you know, fifties uh, drama on oppression. And he's standing there in his like, you know, fifties garb, like, wait, am I getting anal swab? Like what, what, what's happening here? You know?
That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, listen, so, all right. So as, as directors, when we're on a set, there's always that one day that the fit hits the shan, the light's not there, the camera breaks, the, the there's anal swabs on, on, on set. Something happens that, that you, you feel like the entire world's coming crashing down around you on, on Greenvale or on any project. What was that day and how did you overcome it as a director? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I think that obviously, you know, there's different types of, of people, you know, some people thrive under, you know, that immense pressure, you know, some people don't, I, I, I think that, you know, whether I make the right decisions or the wrong decisions, I usually, I enjoy that level of, of pressure. So I think for me, like, um, you know, I sort of expect those, there's a level of anxiety where I just expect everything Every to go wrong. So when All only two things go wrong, it's like, well, that was a great day. So I think my mindset's a little bit different, but there's always, you know, I mean, I've had instances where actors have like, you know, disagreed with a note and walked off and we've had to shoot coverage of his female counterpart by herself. Um, you know, we've had instances where, um, Wow. I had an actor fire our first AD because he hated him on something some years ago. And we were sort of left pick, you know, choosing between an actor and the AD. And, you know, I mean, there were just, I, I feel like there, there have been some sort of crazy instances where, uh, you know, everything that I've sort of done on like the linear space has been, you know, a passion project. So like when people come to do that, it's because they're passionate about it. So when you challenge that or change the vision or adjust, or it's not what they thought, like there's emotions run really high, you know, and that's exciting, but it's also terrifying because I think when you're, whether it's a DP or a production designer or an actor oh. or, or a costume designer, if you sort of show up and tell us, well, you know, we can't afford that, or we lost the light, we're going to have to shoot it differently. You know, as a director, all you can do is really maintain like this even keel positivity around even though you know that it's probably a complete fuck up, you're like, no, it's going to work. This is going to work. This is the right thing. You know, let's, let's keep going. And, um, and, you know, that sort of like resolute need to like keep the troops marching is really important. Um, and I don't know if there's any one specific thing. It feels like every day or every few oh, days, every day. Oh, there's always something that's so, I mean, we've lost, um, you know, I think the biggest thing has always been, you know, uh, working on, on this latest thing, I think, you know, this was like a, a drama that also had, you know, tonally was sci-fi as well as, it, it, you know, there was some levity to how the characters interact. You know, John would call it a play. You know, it was, it was the dialogue was sort of like repetitious and it, it you know, it felt um, lyrical. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of that was worked out on set in rehearsal and we had no time to rehearse. So those were the things that were the most challenging. We're sort of, you know, we're shooting 18 pages today. If you rehearse that scene one more time, everything was, was pertinent. You know, we lose another valuable scene at the end of the day where we have to get an insert on the gun. If we don't, yeah. no one knows she has a gun and that's the tension, you know? So things like that, what I think were the, were the toughest, where it was sort of like, okay, like, you know, wh what are we going to compromise on that still collectively, if I step back, you know, this world still works. We need so many people to believe uh, that this thing works. And I think those, those, um, those are the sort of things that I felt like I've, I've, I've learned over the years is sort of like when to really compromise and when to vocalize that we need to get it right. Um, yeah. And there's the other thing too, man, is like that they don't tell you, especially when you're coming up, man, I don't know if this happened to you or not, but you get, you know, you're normally, I remember when I was the youngest guy on set, I'm, I'm sure you do as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you and, I'm, I'm 20, I'm 20 and a half. I'm, I'm 20, at least 20 and a half. Uh, uh, so, but when you're the youngest guy or you're just starting out, the crew most of the time is most of the time is a little bit more experienced than you. And sometimes the actors are more experienced than you. Yeah. And that's yeah, when, yeah. and that's, when, and by the way, often, right? Like, I mean, there's always going to be someone that's more experienced than you. It doesn't matter if you're who you are, really. Like, you, you truly, to a certain, to a certain extent, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah you're always yeah, going to be, yeah. but this is when, this is what they don't teach you at film school, which is who's testing you to see how far they can push you. And that's the actors. And that's also with key crew people as well. I mean, I've had DPs who were interested in their reel and not so much interested in what I was doing. They just wanted to get their shot. Yeah, because they knew that was going to be in the real, and they didn't really care about working 
you know, they, they took the project because they're like, oh, we're going to be on this location. I'm going to get the techno crane and I'm going to yeah. do this and this. Oh, I'm going to fight for this shot because this is going to get my this is going to be on my demo reel. And how would you handle that? So how did you like how would you, you know, so psychologically? For, do it? So first. So the first time it happened, um, I didn't know what the hell to do. And I had to like kind of, you know, the very first time it happened, I had two. And I told the story before, but I'll tell it again. My very first time I, I spent I, on my demo reel when I shot my 35 millimeter commercial demo reel. Wow. I spent around, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm that old. Um, I <laughs> yeah, shot, yeah. I shot, uh, it cost me about 50 grand back in the day. All wow. right. And I hired a, D, a DP team. So, problem number one DP team. <laughs> Have you worked with a DP team? No, nobody does because it doesn't exist. But with this, <laughs> But with these guys, they had a they had a grip truck. They had access to the film camera. I needed a high speed film camera. We were shooting at ninety frames. You know, I was doing some like really fashion commercial stuff that I was doing. Uh, you know, I had a model who was a friend of mine, and we were doing this whole like sports model thing. And they were so they were mostly industrial guys, and sometimes commercial guys, and not LA sometimes commercial guys. This is Florida sometimes commercial guys. So that means that they didn't have the same experience as a California or New sure, York sure. team. Sorry, anybody living in Florida. I, I know a lot of good guys down there, but you know what I mean? It was just they just didn't have the experience that sure, sure. that the, the crews on the other side to have a lot of times. So they came in and I was so terrified that they didn't know what they were going to do with this film stock because we were shooting reversal stock. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't see that's I, I've never shot a <laughs> film in my life. The, the anxiety. I can't. Even oh, God. Dude. So shot, shooting on reversal stock because I wanted to do that whole like McG. 90s yeah, yeah. blown out I bet it looks amazing I bet oh, it looks it's, amazing. it's it's fascinating it's wonderful i love that it's still one of my favorite things i ever shot oh, so man, it was it. it's it's so it's it was uh we shot this whole thing but i was so terrified because i'm like this is with with um with reversal stock you've got a half stop yeah latitude yeah, yeah. you can't you can't jack you can't jack around yeah yeah, so, yeah yeah so i like literally printed out an entire packet on how to shoot reversal stock i was so terrified for the, D, for, I, the DPs, for the DPs, for the DPs, yeah, yeah. and gave it to them, dude. They they must. I mean, we shot it and we got it in the can, but they they took forever to light. They both of them are running around with their light meters, like clicking every freaking corner. Oh my like, gosh! Oh my the God, anxiety, all over the, the anxiety. And then and then wait, and then high speed. So then you <laughs> hear that film cam go. Oh my god! And you hear that sound, and all I'm hearing is like. Five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars. <laughs> exactly, exactly. dollars, exactly, hundred fifty dollars. It. it was just flying by, and I'm like, "Please don't snap! Please don't snap! Please don't snap!" Because if it snaps, oh my god, we're done. And I didn't have like rolls and rolls of exactly, exactly. And so, how are you even going to get more rolls if you're out like that's it, 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 it was it was insane. It was insane. So those guys, I and then I then we did another spot the next day, and they were so bad. They were trying to like muscle their way into what I was doing. And I was looking at what they were doing. I'm like, this is not good. And I just, at the end of the day, I scrapped the entire thing. I burned the negative. Wow. I literally wow. burned it. I burned it. And then I rehired a new DP and I spent another $20,000 and shot the spot that I wanted the way I wanted to do it and got it done right. So, but with that, those days, those guys, I was just like, I was just constant. And I was yelling out, we're at a half stop. We're one, four. Like I was the one constantly yelling out, I know what we need to be at here. And I was I was on them, on them, on them, on them, because I was just so insecure. Yeah, yeah, just looked, yeah. They did, you know, the, the, by the way, first day one, the entire grip team walked off within 10 minutes. That's how ridiculous. Th that's my first day. First day, I'm spending all my money and the entire grip department walks away in the first 10 wow. minutes because wow. they were so unprofessionals. They didn't know what to do. So I was just like, oh, my God. So that's that extreme. But then I've had other TPs who are like older guys who just, for whatever reason, wanted to like wave their, you know what, in my face. and just Right, 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 right. No, no, I don't think that's the way the shot is going to be. So then that's the point where you as a director have to go, look, man, we're going to have a half a cup conversation. Yeah. And it's not. And, yeah. and, and but that's how you get tested. And then actors yeah. test you within the first five or 10 minutes. And they test you just to make sure that they feel comfortable. You totally, totally. And safe and safe. Totally. If they feel safe, they'll give you the world. But if they don't totally. feel safe, that's when the problems start. Well, you agree? That, that, that's like, um, you know, that's why we did this project is because John and I, having worked together, you know, we've shot two things. We, you know, we shot a, a movie. We shot the Netflix special. And then, you know, we've done a handful of commercials together that he's starred in, uh, that, that, that he's brought me in on to, to direct, which has been amazing. 
But there was sort of a level of trust that was there. And the trust wasn't, you know, that's what people sometimes, you know, they hear that and they go, oh, he trusted you to make it the make him the best he can be. It's really it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the final result. It was trust to explore, you know, and this trust to be able to take risks and and own those risks. And that's the thing that, um, you know, you'll find a lot of actors will either, you know, really don't want to do. They're going to give you what they're going to give you because they don't trust that when you're in the editing room, you're not going to completely fuck it up. Um, you know, or there's the other ones, there's the actors that just go totally crazy and need you to hone them in linearly, you know, and remind them where we're at in the arc. And if you don't, you you know, you're not going to have a a, a project you can piece together, um, you know, from a, from a story beat perspective. But I think with, with John, like the thing that I, you know, admire about him so much is that, you know, we sat down and I pitched this thing to him and, you know, he said, you know, it was a character he never played before and he wanted to, I mean, maybe he talked about it already, but, Mm -hmm. but you know, to be able to get on set and watch him do something different every take that still was in the world, but they were different decisions, you know, based on different, you know, sort of like organic, um, uh, you know, justifications, you know, wh- whether it was an action or, you know, you know, linearly he thought, oh, maybe I should be at a different point in my journey here. Let's try two things. The fact that he was so open to explore that is, is, is why this ultimately works and is successful because we block shot, you know, 300 pages and he was shooting you know, seven dinner scenes back to back from episode one, episode eight, back to episode three, episode seven. And, you know, if we didn't have that trust to, to, to sort of stumble through it together, you know, I think it would be like a very different project. So I think he, you know, he's one of those rare guys that you just think like, like like you, you've done everything in your career. You've, you've been everywhere, worked with everybody, and you're still just trying to be better, like better at everything you know and he and he's doing it i mean every step of the way he bests the the last year of his career you know it's 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 interesting that 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 concept of allowing the space to explore yeah um is so important to actors and john spoke about it in the interview that we had that he's like let me bump around yeah me keep me there's a box yeah i might not know where the end of the box is yeah but that's your job to pr- bring me back in if I'm going too far off or I totally. leave the box that we're, we're putting in, but let me play within the box and don't totally. just try to throw me down the middle because that's when you stifle me. If you stifle me, you're not going to get anything out of me. T- totally. To- and you think that, you know, this is a guy that's like a Tony winning playwright. You know, I mean, this is a guy who has a Smithsonian, like you can't put him on set and say, you got to do this one thing. I mean, he's- Give him a all... line reading. Give him a line reading. See what works. Well, and and, and works. He's, he has stories about that from, a, from, from certain movies where he goes, you know, a director was giving me a line reading and it was like the three worst months of my life. I just showed up. I was a robot. It's like, that's just, some people like that. I mean, there are actors that want to go to work and just do the one thing and go home. Like, he's just not that guy, you know? And that's what, you know, that's what no, I love passion. about- what, oh, Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about working with him. It's the most incredible yeah. thing. In, in the world and like between that and his activism and this sort of like, I mean, he, he, I don't know if he sleeps one hour a day or what, but like, <laughs> you know, I mean, he just was like put on this earth to, to make waves in that way and you can't stop him. No. And it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, and, and we, we'll, we won't turn this into a John love fest because then he, you know, he'll love gonna, that. His, he'll his, love his, that. his head, his head's going to get too big and you know, it already uh, is. It already <laughs> is useless trying to, no, but no, but but in all honesty, though, like you look at you look at an actor like him who's done so many different varieties. I mean, Moulin Rouge and yeah, Romeo and yeah. Juliet and Casualties of War, and and then yeah, you just yeah. and then the list just goes on and on. And just like you know, I was when I was preparing for his his conversation, I just went back through his IMDb and his filmography. I'm like, Jesus Christ! Like there was yeah. so many movies that you're just like, that's right, Carlito's way. Yeah, that's right, Romeo. Yeah. Jo- Oh, he was in that too. Oh my God, that's right. He was, and you just go back and, you know, like I brought up Spawn because I'm like, no one ever, never, no one ever calls out Spawn, the clown. It's one of the best performances, one of his best performances ever. I'm like, it's just insanity. And then he told, and then he said he he didn't know what he he had no idea what he was going to do up until the director yelled action for this entire time. Did you believe that? that? I I believe it. Yeah. And I mean, he, 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 we were talking at some point about the voice of, of the sloth and ice age and how he tried a bunch of stuff and also didn't know what he was going to do. And, and, and the studio liked what he did or something like that. I, I might be telling this story wrong, but then eventually, you know, he got behind the mic and did something and it was like, no, that's it. That's the thing, you know? And it's, it's, it's incredible to see that. I mean, I hate him as a person, but he's a talented guy. <laughs> I mean, he's a horrible human being, he's but as an, actor. Human. as an actor, he's, he's, he's phenomenal to watch enamoring. 
No, but to be, but to be as a but to be as a performer, and this is also yeah. the way it is with directors. There's certain directors who who work this way. Yeah, that yeah. work kind of like on the on like my last film I did, I shot in four days at Sundance about filmmakers trying to sell a movie at Sundance. I stole nice, the entire movie. Nice. Stole the entire movie. Beautiful. I got there and I just like let's roll and let's see what happens. And I was yeah. like, oh my god, this is like what it feels like to be an actor in many ways because we were all as a collective creative collective figuring it out along the way to the point where when we got in the when we when were on the plane they're like oh so do you have it i'm like i don't know yeah yeah we don't know yeah we'll, we'll put it together I, I, put something i there. have no idea if we have a movie i have no idea if we have a movie i think we have a movie my That's experience so says but it was in such a low budget and it was just kind of like me just experimenting having fun that you were just like oh my god this feels so you feel so alive totally. as opposed to being on a commercial set where you're working with a client and, and it, it, that has its own energy and its own thing. But this, you feel like, oh my God. Yeah, there's an immediacy like, to it. There's such an immediacy to it. Right. Like the Duplass brothers or, or John Sw Joe Sonsberg, who did these kind of like, you know, uh, mumblecore films back in the day yeah. that yeah. they're just kind of like, here's an outline. Let's all figure it out today. Yeah. 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 Happens. Yeah. Totally. Exciting as hell to do that. It's terrifying, but it's terrifying. so, yeah. Yeah. But it's exciting. <laughs> totally. Totally. I, it's more exciting if it turns out well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it didn't work out, it's like yeah, yeah, so yeah. You're much. like, oh, we went through that. Okay, I don't know if I'll do that again. But so, is there is there something that you wish you would have told yourself if you had an opportunity to go back at that first, the first beginnings of your career, to tell yourself, listen, Adam, Adam this this is you got to watch out for this. Yeah, that's a good. That, that's a really good question. I, I think you know there was this. Uh, I did a movie some years ago um, called Syrup with mm -hmm. Amber. It was with Amber Heard, Shiloh Fernandez. Never heard of her. I never heard of her. Never heard of her. Never heard Kellen, of her. Kellen Lutz, a few other people. It, it, and it was based on a book. And it was, you know, it, it was um, it was probably like sort of the first like bigger thing that I did. It was an indie, you know, but yeah. it was it was. Um, I saw, I mean, it looks, it looks amazing. It looks, and it you was, were like yeah, talking big, to camera, you were talking to it, camera, so they had a little vibe to it. it yeah, cool. they talked to cameras, you know, but it was, it was also from a, uh, a structural perspective, it was problematic. You know, we had to go back and do reshoots and we had to, uh, you know, it, it was, the, that's one thing I've also learned just as an aside, you know, there's a script that can read really well, but, <laughs> but, but with experience, you learn what's going to play to an audience sometimes that, that, that isn't on the page. And I think that's, that's the difference between those really, really good directors that can see, that can read a script or, or, or a writer director who can write something that they know is going to translate. Because that was one instance where we wrote a lot of direct to camera uh, talking at the audience. Educating. Breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, breaking the fourth wall. We started, wall. you know, testing it and we realized that like audiences don't want to be talked to. They want to be shown things, you know. And so it read really well because it was this sort of flippant, cheeky dialogue about marketing and people read through the scripts, agents loved it, actors loved it. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a beloved script based on a great book. You know, we, we went and shot the script and, 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 and we were excited about it. And I was excited about it. And then we watched it and it was like, wait a sec, we got to go back and rework things uh, because it just doesn't, it doesn't, we're not rooting for these characters in the same way, but I, you know, back, back to your, wait, what was your question? I don't even remember. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> if there's something that you wish you would have told your younger self. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I screened this, this film for, for a producer and, um, and she said, you know, it's not there, um, but trust me when I say it's not going to be your last movie. You're going to be fine. And um, and I was <laughs> wrecked. You don't want to hear that. Like, you don't know. No, you there. never want to. You'll work again. That's no, you won't, no li li literally, you'll work again. No, and, and that's like, I mean, because I always try to be like, it's really honest about these things. Like, like, you know, I've made a lot of shitty, like very, very bad things because I, that's how I learned to make, to try to make better. And hopefully my work is getting better as we go. Sure. And this is hopefully not the best thing I'll ever do. And hopefully there'll be more that's better. But, um, you know, I think there are those guys that are those, you know, those filmmakers that just, you know, they pop onto the scene and that's like, they, their first movie is like a hit, you know, that was like, yeah. definitely not me, you know? And, and that was the biggest piece of advice I wish I actually took in was this notion that like every time I did something bad, I thought, well, this is the last, this is the end. It's never, yep. it was never a learning experience. It was always like, this is shameful, you know, I'm shamed. No one will ever talk to me. And you know what? And you know what? And you know, look, did that stop me from making my first feature for almost 15, 20 years? Because yeah, exactly, of that. Right. There you go. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Because of that energy of like the, the, if I got to make a movie, it's got to be Reservoir Dogs. 
No, it's got no. it's got to it's got to it, be it a mariachi. Doesn't. It's got to be paranormal activity. It's got to be something that explodes out of it. And that's the, and then that's the mentality. That was the kind of the the, the Kool Aid that I drank from the nineties coming yeah. up because that's what yeah. everything was like. It had to be this huge thing. And, and those were those zingy indies where it was like the only indies you heard about were those indies that were just the best movies that had ever come out in those years. Like period. Absolutely. And the directors yeah. all went off to have insane uh, careers. So course. that was what I thought I had to do. I was like, oh, if I'm going to make something, it has to be like, yeah, res- it has yeah. to be Reservoir Dogs. But yeah, then yeah. then you look back and you go, no, nobody else made a Reservoir Dogs. They all made their own things. Kevin made Clerks, Linkletter yeah. made Slacker. That They, they all did their thing. Yeah. Um, but and they were right time, right place, right product, all that kind of stuff as well. But at a certain point, you just got to just do it. That's when I when I finally hit 40, I just said, screw it. I'm just going to go make a movie. And from the moment yeah. I came up with the idea to the when we we're done with production it was two months. It was yeah, yeah. Well, and, 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 and that's what happens, right? You just you get that motivation. You just go and do it. And you have to be sort of like, uh, you know, it's neurotic it's about it and blinded by it. Well, no, I did it so fast. So I, I couldn't talk myself out of it because if you sit yeah, six, yeah, yeah, six yeah. months, eight months, you're like, oh, well, I need this camera or I need, yeah, 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 right, uh, I need right, this right. cast. Or I, need, right. I didn't want to give myself. A, so it was like a, a experiment on myself to just go. I'm just going to get it done to yeah. prove to myself that I could tell a story yeah. and I could yeah. sell a movie and it did all that. It was. Is yeah. uh, fascinating. Now we've been t- we've been dipping around or towing around the Green Veil. Vale. Tell me about the Green Veil, vale and and it's really interesting. John talked a bit about it in his interview. I find it fascinating that you guys kind of did an indie series, uh, so, you know, self financed indie series. Then now you're out in the marketplace trying to sell, yeah. which is something that doesn't get done often. It has done been done, but not at this level that I know of. It. Yeah, least, yeah, yeah. With yeah. this kind of cast and this kind of production. So tell me about the project. So, yeah, I mean, so, so we, um, you know, I, I knew having been in commercials for a while, um, I knew that I wanted to try to get back into like some linear expression, you know, some content that we, you know, whether it was serialized content, whether it was a film or whatever. So we, you know, just because I, I launched this agency and studio, we sort of had the facilities to launch a, a, a television film, uh, division as a financier, um, we, you know, we've sort of been blessed with our clients and subsidized that film and television production with money that we, you know, made on the the agency side. Um, And so this was sort of that first project for me that was like a proof of concept as a a quote unquote, like studio that's financing, just to kind of prove that we could do this. Um, So I think for, for, for us, it's like, we knew that we wanted to be in TV. We've never done TV before. Um, you know, we could pitch for years and try to figure that out, or we could just go out and do something and sort of stumble through it. That's sort of always been my approach. Obviously, um, <laughs> as, 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 we've, as we've made many points of in this interview, <laughs> uh, you know, it's great. You learn it, anything, it, works, from... it works for you, sir. <laughs> and it's fine. If you learn anything, it's don't do it this way. I'm sure there's an easier way that will take you less time. <laughs> um, but, 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 but no, but I mean, you know, so I, I, having worked with John before, John and I were just coming off the, the Netflix thing that, that was a lot of fun and, you know, received well. And, um, and John, I was reading these articles about um, alien invasions that happened in the 50s. And it was this very sensationalized period when there was a lot of, you know, repression and oppression from housewives to, um, you know, Native Americans, to immigrants, to, to, to everybody, really, you know, was very oppressed in a certain way. It was post-World War II. Women were working during World War II and they were, uh, you know, really running things while men were off at war. And then they came back and there was this reckoning, you know, where women were now suddenly housewives again. Men were trying to like recommand control of their families. And, you know, there was this insane eradication of sort of like Native Americans. So anyways, I wanted to put all that stuff together because it just, it felt like if we could sort of sensationalize, uh, uh, you know, a a story that sort of is grounded in this sci-fi element where there were these, you know, these, these sort of like true reported UFO sightings with, uh, you know, themes of assimilation and oppression in the fifties, it would make for like a really interesting world. Like at that time, I didn't know what it was going to be, but it just felt like it was a really interesting you know, let's do an anthology on oppression in America with a really interesting tone that feels like it's not just a drama and it's not just preachy that it's, you know, right. we've got a hook. So I, I looped John in and said, you know, can you play this like all American dad who's like Latin, but we don't say that he's Latin. And there's these really hidden, bizarre undertones of his patriotism. And John was like, you know, I've always wanted to play like a self-loathing, self-hating 
you know, Latin, I mean, what he calls is, you know, like a Trumpian lat, lat uh, Trumpian, uh, you know, supporter, you know, Latin Trump supporter or something. Got it, got it. And, um, and so, you know, he was always fascinated with like the, the, the leader of the Proud Boys, who's like this Latin guy. And he's like, what, what is he doing? Like, how is that real? You know? And, 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 and so, you know, we crafted hold on, this. Oh, I got to stop. He's like, did you ever see the Dave Chappelle bit where he was the, uh, the blind Ku Klux Klan? Yes, guy. yes, yes, yes. And he yes, was like, yes, and he was completely, yes. oh my God. Was so, so something like that is what you're saying. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, it, was literally, it was literally that, you know? And, and, and so that's what we, you know, I said, well, you know, why don't you play this all American guy who like, you know, obviously there's some like, you know, deeply rooted like systemic issues there, but you're tasked with, you know, assimilation, like native assimilation at the FBI. And you're, you're an American, you're an American and a patriot. And, and let's let you reckon with those issues. And he's like, I've never played that role before. I, 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 I trust that we can have fun with this and see where it goes. And from a, from a, you know, not a therapeutic standpoint, but like as an actor, it was something that he like, you know, wanted to embrace. And that, that was the project. So we thought, you know, let's root it in this family with you and sort of like, see where this thing goes. And that, that's the green bill. It's a story of, uh, Gordon Rogers, who's played by John Leguizamo, um, and he's tasked with native assimilation on the East Coast, which is is something that happened all, all, was rampant, yeah. you know, in in the U.S. and in Canada, as you know, evident by the you know discovery of these boarding schools and you know um, these mass graves under these boarding schools that we just found in, in in Canada recently. But you know, John's character is making way for a pipeline, and there's a lot of nefarious things he's doing. And his wife finds out that there was some, uh, you know, he was investigating an alien invasion that may or may not be an alien invasion and you know uh shit hits the fan from there and uh you know john's character ultimately is forced to sort of reckon with you know who he is and um you know and where he's going you know in this in this world and that's and that's that's how we got to eight episodes of the show. that's amazing and then and you got to try back at the screen yet or not it's yeah, it screened on Monday night, and it's uh, we had an online thing on Wednesday, and then we just screened last night was our our uh, our second screening. And uh, how's it how how, did, how is it being received? It was great. I mean, it was received really well. You know, we got a couple uh, really positive reviews, and you know, people seem very into it. And I think you know the challenge for us is obviously you know educating a marketplace on an independent TV show. And that's something that is, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, we know the sort of indie model of acquisitions and, uh, uh, you know, on the it's TV fun, side, isn't it? Isn't that fun? Isn't that the fun part? <laughs> it, it's, it's just, it's a lesser known, you know, it's a lesser known reality, but I think like, you know, it's, it's something that we feel really passionate about. I don't think we would have gotten this show made had we not, you know, financed it um, oh, and, yeah. and developed it with John in a way that just, you know, he wanted to play this role and that's, and that's what we did. And, and, and I, you know, he, he's, I would never want it. That's something I've learned is that, you know, working with new exciting actors is great, but working with like your best friends that you trust and who trust you is, is, is the best thing in the world. It doesn't matter what the project is. And man, that's it's because, because you go, because you've gone into war together already, man. You yeah. You, know, you have, just, you just, you see, a, you've been in the shit. You've been it's in a different the shit. level. It's a different level of trust that you just can't, uh, overestimate you know it's no absolutely it's, absolutely the dp i took the sundance with me i he was i'd done a p- couple projects with him and i'm like i could i just knew shoot just shoot i know it's gonna yeah. be done and it's like i don't have to worry about that because yeah, you just know yeah. they're gonna get, they got your back and then when you work with yeah. actors again and again you're like yep i know that they're bringing that toolbox with them today and yeah and, yeah and, yeah and they got your back and when you're going into you're going into the war man it's like full metal jacket man you just you know or you know you joker you know, or are you, 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 just want, you just want to do better work also when you're working with yeah. people that challenge you to, to, to be that's that, true. you know, that that's the thing, like, you know, yeah. I mean, there's something about, I mean, that was always my thing with John is like, he, he has always just challenged me to like, you know, let's make it a little bit better, a little bit better. Let's push, give it to someone else push. for notes. Let's go, you know, and he's always had to work. I mean, he's been vocal, but he's had to work harder than everybody else to, 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 to get to where he is. And that is, you know, I, I was something I reckoned with on Latin history for morons, right? Like, you know, I'm a white Jew from the Valley um, directing Latin history for morons. You know, I mean, that was something that I would have conversations with him about and be like, I, am I the right guy for this? Am I, are you sure you want me to, you know, and he would always say, you know, you, yes, you're the right guy because the vision that you, the, the, your vision is what I want within this project. And like, that's allyship and it's okay to be an ally and it's okay to still support and try to be the best you can be. And so I feel like our, you know, something about, like you said, going into battle, but with really dissonant views on things 
and then challenging those views and sort of coming together with like, you know, a common narrative is the thing that, you know, I love most and sort of cherish about that relationship. Well, I mean, I really, I, I really hope you do well with this. Uh, and this Thank is hopefully you, a new mo- I hope this is a new model for a lot of people out there because look, man, it's, it's, a, it's a tough slog doing into films, man. You know, I, and I, I'm, it, it the, is, I, it is. I, I'm in the trenches every day talking to people yeah. every day about it from every aspect, from the script all the way to distribution. I know what's going on with that. And this might be another Avenue where creatives. I mean, look, all the indie guys from the nineties, most of them have gone into television. Right, right. Exactly. All, all exactly. of the early 2000s, like all they're all into, cause that's where the cool stuff, that's why television it's, is. It's so cool. Yeah. So good because the writing totally. is so good. And, and it's just, you know, and I don't be I able just, to explore a story in like multiple episodes and, you and know, take slowly. your time and, and build it up and all that stuff. It's remarkable. I've never done anything like that. It's incredible. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. To ask all of my guests, sir. Let's go. What advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Uh, um, a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business. I mean, again, <laughs> just do I, it and see how it works out. <laughs> I think you just got to do it and see. I mean, there's like, you know, uh, you just got to do it. I mean, you just got to do like if you have a vision and a story that no one else is told, you know, a, 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 that's something worth risking everything for. So go do it. What did you learn from your biggest failure? What did I learn from my biggest failure? Um, you know, to just dust it off and get back up and shrug it off and do it and, and, and keep going. I mean, I think that's, that's always, I mean, this is like such a brutal town, you know, I mean, like, you know, if a movie's bad, an agent won't get you a job anymore. The yeah, an actor won't work with you, whatever, but it's all bullshit. I mean, who cares? Like, right. Yeah. Everyone, everyone's, you know, when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. And it's like next, but then five years later, you write something that everyone wants now. And they're like, Adam, a hundred percent. How you doing? Ben Affleck. I think when he won his Academy award, uh not the first one but like the second time like after his like sort of yeah yeah his resurgence or whatever i think you know he said it best he's like you know this business is about like just not holding grudges forgiveness and just you know that's just i mean it's cyclical don't take it personal you can't take it because again like you're like as creators like we're throwing everything into these projects emotionally and no one else is the agents are not, the executives are not, no one's, no one is throwing themselves into these things. Like, so we take everything personally, of course, like we're going to, but at the end of the day, like, uh, you know, you, you have to just expect the unexpected. If it doesn't work, you know, you get up and you do it again. If, if you were meant to do it, if it's truly what you have to do to survive, like you're going to do it again. I tell you, I heard, I was watching an interview with Taylor Sheridan uh, this last weekend and I'm just the biggest Taylor Sheridan fan in the way he's like, so amazing yeah. what he's doing. He's, he's working at a level that, all of yeah. us afraid to be working at, at what yeah, he's yeah, doing yeah. right now. And he said, you know, I've, I've been in this town for a long time. I've never seen anybody bump their head against the wall or crash their head against the wall for 20 years and then pop. Yeah. 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 I was like, wow, that's such a profound comment, man. It really is because he goes, I've seen eight years. I've seen 10 years, seen 12 years, but I've never seen 20 years. And that's when I decided I'm always going to be the 11th on the call sheet. I'm never going to be number one on the call sheet. <laughs> Maybe I should write. And that's what he did. Yeah, because he yeah. was, you know, and, and yeah. he's working it. And when he wrote his when he wrote the pilot, the first thing he ever wrote was the pilot for Mayors of Kingstown. Uh-huh. After he wrote the pilot, he's like, damn it, I wish I would have been doing this 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I wasted all right. that time just just trying to make it ha- hacking it out as an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really wanted to do this is where I needed to be. So and he goes, and this is something I think everyone listening to, and I think you might agree with this. The town will tell you what you are supposed to be doing to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. to a certain extent it's like i'm never going to be a leading man i'm not going to be right. tom cruise i'm not built to be tom cruise i don't have the talent nor the looks um to be tom cruise but if my mind i was like i'm going to be the next tom cruise the town's going to tell you maybe you're not tom cruise right but you i might think you're be. tom cruise i appreciate that sir thank you I do, but I do. but but you could be something else that is actually going to make you happier and actually more true to your path so that sure. you just got to listen, keep the ears open for that kind of stuff. Now, what is yeah, the lesson that took you? What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, I, I don't know if I've learned it yet. Um, uh, what's the lesson that has taken me the longest to learn? Um, you know, to not try to do everything. <laughs> yep. I think that would probably be the biggest lesson. I think, um, 
you know, it's easy for people on the outside to say, you know, well, why don't you, um, you know, delegate? Uh, and it's easy for us on the inside to say, well, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough of this. I have to do it. I have to do it. Um, when you have the right support team around you, it is exceptional. Like the things that you can accomplish are exceptional, no matter how much you want to control everything. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And sometimes, you know, you have to, um, you have to do multiple things or you have to wear multiple hats and that's fine. But I think, you know, early on, I always felt like I really had to control things. Well, because uh, no one's going to do it better than you. Right. 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 Or no one knows, or, or it's proving the narrative that I'm the director, whatever, whatever it is, oh. you know, but I think like, <laughs> yeah, as yep, you, yep. as you, you know, as you grow, you learn that the, the, the best thing you can do is let everybody else thrive and then just take credit for it. I, you know what? The masters have said that so many times. You're like, that's all you can do. Just, you know, whoever you're going to get the credit at the end of it. Just let it I, all. That's what, that's what I say. That's what I always say to the crew. I'm like, you can give me, if you, if you want to, you know, overwork to give me all these ideas, I'll still take credit for it. So that's fine. Work harder. <laughs> give me the ideas. Let's go. No, I'm just joking. I mean, I, it, it, it is, it is, I mean, you know, to be humble and to be able to say, you know, what do you think? I don't know what this is going to look like. Let's let's talk about it is I think the, the biggest lesson, biggest but that also but also takes you a minute to, to get to that point. As no, it does. It does. You have to you have to you have to go through that process. I, like, I don't know if, if anyone on their, you know, their very first movie was like, you know, oh, yeah, I am going to just ask for everybody's advice. It's, all the it's, time. Like, I don't, because you're like, I'm not the director anymore. And then you get that chip on your shoulder. Like, am I the director? I have to, I have to prove that I'm the director. Right, right, I have to right. have my name as a director. I can be only directed only and written by only. And I, and I have to do everything. Yeah. At the beginning, you have to feel that way. But as you get older and you get more settled into your, and more comfortable yeah. in your own skin as a director, that's when you just go, best idea wins. Right. Right. And I think, and I think also n- not over directing is also another big thing, not over controlling, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's actors that you just need to set the camera and just watch them surprise you. And then there's actors that you really have to work with. And then there's actors that are somewhere in between who want a little bit or whatever, but like really recognizing that with actors, with behind the camera talent, with the production design team, with whatever, like there, there are, there are people that will feel more empowered and do better if you let them, you know? And I think, you know, really understanding how to lead different departments you know, in unique ways is something that, that, that is super, super important. And, and, and it's like, you know, I always tell people like, just ask, like, you know, ask how someone likes to, I mean, I talked to John about the first day, you know, how do you want to work? Like, what, how are you most successful? Like, that's going to be, is it one take? Are you, do you warm up with three and then we get into it on four? Do you want me to stop you in the middle of takes? Do you want me to let you complete, even though we know it's wrong? Like there's so many different avenues for how to, to lead a set. And I think, you know, very early on, it's like, you know, I'm going to do it this way and this is what I'm going to do. And it's, it's, it's my show and blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, you know, it's, you know, really understanding the mechanisms that help people thrive is just the biggest thing that you can do, um, you know, as a, as a director. And I think, and I, I, there were multiple times, I think Donald Petrie told me once he directed like Miss Congeniality and how to lose a guy in 10 days. And he, he said, you know, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like, don't be afraid. And he was, this is after, this is, I think I was going to syrup in New York. And I said, you know, what, what do you have? To, you know, I'm shooting in New York and blah, blah. blah. And he said, you know, don't, uh, you got to ask for help. You know, when you need help, you have to, it's going to be more endearing when you say, I don't know how to shoot this scene. Let's talk about it. And people are going to work harder for you than if you just stumble through it and just pretend, you know, what's going on. And everyone thinks, I don't know if this is right. You know? Um, and that was like a really, you know, a really powerful thing. And then I was, uh, shadowing Rodrigo Garcia, who did um, a bunch of really cool uh, movies. And he was doing this thing with Annette Benning, And I, you know, I think I was just shadowing him a couple of days. And he said, you know, he just let her work. You know, he let her dictate everything. And he covered the scene in a way that would let her roam around if she wanted to pick up a cup, if she wanted to, you know, he, he, he knew he played to her talent, you know, and that was like such an important lesson also, which, oh yeah, like, you know, if you've got a great actress, like you, you have to support what they're trying to do. You can't box them in. You can't, you can't like, you can't. okay, hit Mark A, hit Mark B, but if she wants to flow. Yeah. 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 That's the thing they don't teach you, man. Like sometimes when you, and especially when you're working with these, these actors who are at a different level, like John or Annette and, <clears> you know, and I've had the opportunity to work some with some actors as well that I've just, you know, when they, when you, when you have an Oscar nominee on set, you just go, Oh, 
oh, that's how that's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. feel the difference. You just like, oh, okay. So, how do you how do you want to work? How do you want to do this? How do you flow? It's 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 a, it's a remarkable experience when you get to work with really really talented people on all levels on every yeah. every, every 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 crew member and actors. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel, I feel like you learn how to, you know, in film school or whatever, I don't know, I didn't go, but you learn, <laughs> theoretically, you, you, you could learn how to technically lay a mark or, you know, marks, sure. you know, and this and that or whatever. But like the reality is you get to set and like that actor is not going to want to hit that mark and they're going to want to have freedom. They're going to want to do. So then what do you do? Like what happens then? You know, and I think that's, that's the thing that is, it's so important that you go out and do it, not just like within your community, but like with random actors that you've never worked with before, with a lot of crazy personalities, because that's the thing that's going to get you honing craft. Now, last question, sir. Three of your favorite films of all time. Through, oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, Big Fish is, I think, my number one favorite movie of all time. Um, I, I just, th there's just something so magical about oh, what Tim so Burton beautiful. was able I, to do. I had, John, I had John on the show, John August on the show. Oh, did you really? I, I talked to him oh. about Big Fish. Dude, it was just such a beautiful, uh, it's one of my favorite Tim Burton movies. It, it, it's same, 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 same. I know, I know. It was just something, I mean, he tapped into something so magical uh, with that film. And, and the way that he tried, the thing I love most is the way he tracked that narrative those, 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 there were multiple narratives. And by the time you get to the end, it paid off to su like, I was sobbing, you know, oh. at the end of the movie, I just, that, that's yeah. what I always wanted to do. My whole life is just make people cry in that way and like be rooting for something. And you think this is the, you know, beautiful problem. That was number one. Number two, uh, Cider House Rules is a yes. movie that Great I movie. really love. Um, Toby, yeah, man. Back in the yeah, Toby McGuire. And I just, it, it just, something was so, you know, so moral. And there were these multiple storylines that just really fit what, because Mike, Michael Caine was in that too, right? Michael Caine was in yes, that. He played, yes. the, he played the and Charlie Theron was in that as the a uh, young the Charlie, a Charlize. Uh, yes, it's just a young Charlize. Yeah, Theron she and then and then I the 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 last movie, uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I just I love one. a spectacle, man. I mean, I just love it. Like there is just something so powerful about like a like. Everyone asks me, you know, oh, what do you want to do? Like a tour of this? I'm like, no, I want to direct like Pirates of the Caribbean eight. Like that. That's like. That's where I want to be. That's great. You know, put that, it out that there. Put it out. you never know who's listening. You never know who's listening, Aaron. So yeah, if you want to, yeah. if you want to make the pitch now for Pirates of the Caribbean eight, you know, I've got the pitch. Let's wait a couple of years. Let's see what Johnny, you know, where Johnny lands, but uh, no, you can't do it without Johnny. You can't, I don't, I don't care what you do. You, you can't, can't do it without. No, but I've been, come on. I mean, Pirates was just, I mean, Gore Verbinski, he's again, he's one of those directors where you just, oh. I mean, this is a guy who's like cutting these scenes in his mind. Well, and he came from commercials and he cut, yeah. and he, and he's out there and he's shooting and he only shoots the things that he knows are going to make it. And then he moves on. And you just think this guy is so efficient in the way that he is crafting scenes. And it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's incredible. Like whether you love the movie or hate the movie, it's, you know, it's, it's a popcorn movie, whatever, but it's just, you know, the way that he sort of put that movie together and was able to get Disney over the line with what, you know, Johnny Depp was doing and, you know, it's tonally, it was just very cool. And I, and I have to say, and, and I'm just going to say it out because what Johnny did I've never seen an actor basically take an entire franchise on his shoulders. Yeah, but yeah, he, yeah. He, he built it without yeah. Johnny, without Captain uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. It's another, yeah. it's another a movie based on a ride from Disney. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. He, he and Gore working together really transcended that to a place yeah. where it's made billions and billions of dollars, totally. and and he's beloved throughout totally. the world because of this character and totally. he was able to tap into something i've i don't remember another man another actor who who did, has done that it, it really it, like, it, and it was at also like, no at that and if you think if you break it down from like i'm going to go back to marketing but like a marketing perspective like from a from a from a purely business perspective like he was playing an inebriated <laughs> that drug for this thing for movie about a crime. Like, 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 right, right. Like you imagine, you imagine that like who, if I was an exec, I'd be like, well, he can't do it. Like, there's no way he can do that. Like it, it looks like he's popping pills and then they rolled and then he forgot his lines. Like what, like you're watching dailies from that and you're just thinking how this does not fit into like our cinematic universe. So I just think it was just so like how, whatever happened there was just the most amazing did thing you, in the Did world. you hear, did you ever hear the story about the gold teeth from Johnny? No. So he, when he was doing Jack, this is before anybody knew what he was going to uh -huh. do with Jack. He already had it in his mind. And he's like, I really wanted 
five gold teeth in my mouth for for Johnny. And uh, they were like, I don't know, gold teeth. I'm not sure. <laughs> that. So he walked in and he goes, I need 12 gold teeth. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we can't give you 12, John. That's too much. He's like, all right, five. He's like, okay, you can have five. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he got his five gold teeth for, for, for Jack Sparrow back in the day. <laughs> well, the five gold teeth were offensive. I mean, he shouldn't have had those. I mean, obviously. I mean, obviously, is, come on. Obviously, it's a very offensive. And no, but you're right. On paper, it makes no sense why that character should work in a movie of that magnitude based on the property and the IP it was for a company like Disney. Like it doesn't make any sense. Right. Like, well, and yeah. And you're like, so you're going to test that with 12 year olds and their, you know, Oh, your, their parents can be, you know, would you let your kid watch, you know, this misogynist pirate who's drug drunk. induced stumbling around dr- drunk all the time. Would that be endearing for you? What do you think? Like, no, it would have never, I mean, that's crazy. You know, I don't even, I would love to hear the story of how like after day one, of shoes well, I, like when the dailies came back was not good i mean i heard that they were freaking out i'm sure like why who wouldn't <laughs> but they were but the ship but but the train left the station already and said, yeah john and johnny was a star and they're like look we're here we're shooting we're in the caribbean we're gonna make this movie and he just he just kept going and gore was with him and he was like no nah, man we're rolling this we're going to the dailies for long enough for them to not have to reshoot or something because you think like that, that <laughs> you think that's what a crazy! No, I would have loved to know what uh, if you interview him. You got to let me know. <laughs> let me know what when happens. I get John. When I get Johnny, uh, he's a little busy these days. I think everybody in the world wants to talk to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when I get, um, hopefully, I'll get Gore on one day. I'd love to talk to Gore about oh how he met it. But listen, all right, man. Listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. It really Thank has. You, Alex. I feel like I feel like, you. you're a bro- I feel like you're a brother from another mother, man. I think we we both got the same similar shrapnel in our in our in our skin totally, about totally, how, totally. how we how we do our things, brother. But I, listen, man, congratulations. I Man, congratulations on the project, on the Green Vale, and I hope it does amazing for you and continued success, brother. I appreciate it. And and don't let John push you around, brother. Seriously, just, you know, sometimes, you know, just slap him around. I think he likes I, I blocked his number. I blocked his number. <laughs> so he's, he's impossible. He's impossible. He's impossible. He, pro- he made me promise not to tell the anal swab story. I told it because I'm just so bitter about him, uh, you know, right now, because he always wants to work with me. He says, you know, I need to work with you. I hate all these other directors. You know, you're the only one I want to do everything with. And I do, John, calm down. John, you're, desperate. John, you're, you're a little, a little needy. John, he's needy. He's desperate. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know. He's not busy. He's not working. I don't know what it is, but he just sits at home just waiting for you to call. That's, that's all he does. No, every, we were doing press for this thing last week and on Friday, and they're asking him about seven other projects, and he's yeah, opening a musical the same day. And I'm, I, I have like whiplash. I'm like, what, what do you mean you're doing all yeah, this? He's like, yeah, I'm doing this movie with De Niro. I'm like, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Right, right, right. Of course. Well, that was the that's the other thing. I mean, he was in Greece on Tuesday. Flew in. <laughs> he, was in Greece, he said, oh, I did this great thing with De Niro. De Niro was amazing. It was this beautiful scene and blah blah. And I'm like, wait, you were in Greece with De Niro yesterday? Like, we're <laughs> What, what, what's happening right now? And then he's opening the musical. And- our, our, this is the, that's a different world, brother. That's a different world that you and I get to get to get to dip our toes in every once in a while. No, it's a, uh, it's a different. It's a different. It's a different existence of of life. And, and, and I hope people see this because he he literally did something that he's never done before. And I think that that's the thing I'm most proud of is being able to champion that that performance for him. No, he's he's amazing, and I wish I, and I hope nothing the best for you in this project, brother. Thank you again for Thanks, coming on Alex. the show, man. Let, let's pleasure, do this brother. again, man. It was so anytime, much fun. brother. Anytime. <laughs>